Hey everyone, uh, my name is Katrina. I am the content coordinator here at Y2Y, -Y, and I am virtually sitting down with uh, my colleague Tim today to talk about that you had um, from our Earth Day post on social media, as well as ones that we've gotten, um, you know, throughout the year. So uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, Tim, and we'll get into it. Great, thanks, Katrina. Uh, my name is Tim Burkhart. I'm uh, the BC Program Manager for Strategic Engagement and for the Peace Country. I lived up in Chetwind for four and a half years and Prince George before that and really love uh, the Northeast and Northern BC and all of its wildness. Awesome. Well, I'm really happy to um, talk to you today. Um, there's been a lot of big news this year in terms of um, caribou protection in the piece. Um, so people did have some great questions. So I'll just start with the first one that we got. Um, and this person asked, and they said, I'm curious about the agreement that was signed for caribou protection. What does it actually do to protect the caribou? Oh, that's a great question. And, and I'm glad we got a lot of questions about this agreement because it is historic. Um, what this agreement does is it, it's an affirmation and recognition of the leadership of West Moberly First Nations, Soto First Nations, and many other Indigenous peoples in Treaty 8 and elsewhere who are leading conservation on the land in their traditional territories. Uh, this agreement builds on the work that uh, West Moberly and Soto have done over the past 50 years, from banning hunting of caribou to uh, maternal penning, all sorts of projects that they've put together that have seen that herd go from, I think, 16 or, or the low numbers to about 100 animals today. What this agreement does is finally gives those nations the tools they have to see that recovery continue and, sta and, and stabilize. Um, and what that agreement, what those tools are, are essentially uh, protection of habitat. That's the most crucial element that's been missing for car from caribou recovery in British Columbia over the past 30 years it has been an, a reluctance from government to actually protect the habitat that caribou re rely on. Um, the agreement has measures to protect, I believe it's just over 200,000 hectares of land in a new indigenous protected area that will do a lot to protect and conserve and recover the Clintsaza herd and many others. Additional land use restrictions where um, all activities on the land have to put caribou first, uh, uh, cover about 550,000 additional hectares across the, the wild hearts and peace country. So I think this really will make a, a major difference in the caribou populations in the Northeast as the First Nations continue with their recovery programs that have been successful, that have been world leading. Uh, they can now ensure that caribou that are recovering have abundant uh, land and habitat from which to, to find homes and new mates. That is huge. Thank you so much for expanding on that. What happens now, now that it's signed and will it be enough? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and there's sort of two parts to the answer. Um, so the agreement was signed in a very moving and powerful ceremony in Vancouver back in February. Um, we heard really great uh, speeches and remarks from Chief Roland Wilson, from Chief Ken Caraman, from uh, the ministers of environment and, and forest, both provincially and federally. But the, now the real work begins. Um, the agreement lays out the steps that all four parties, the uh, West Moberly and Soto First Nations, Canada and British Columbia, will do to recover caribou in the peace region for the central group. And so the next step is the expansion of an, that a new protected area first to 30,000 hectares and then to 200,000 hectares. We need to see the creation of new committees um, that are going to be examining how um, cumulative impacts on the landscape are impacting caribou, how recreation can be better managed to protect caribou, how uh, socioeconomic issues can be integrated with, with caribou recovery. And all of those committees are, are being struck and they're uh, going to happen. They have local representation. They have representation from Canada and government and BC as well. So we, we need a lot of work from British Columbia and Canada as they find the funding and uh, put in the legislation to get those areas, uh, protected areas actually established. And we expect that to, to happen over the course of, of this coming year, the next year. The second part of this agreement uh, or, or question is, 
that there was a BC caribou agreement signed. There are actually two agreements signed. One covers uh, all the caribou in the peace region, what's known as the central group, um, and the other covers all the remaining southern mountain caribou in British Columbia. And this is an agreement just between BC and Canada, and it doesn't have nearly the kind of strong protections for habitats and recovery actions that we see in the agreement, partnership agreement uh, between the two nations, Canada and BC. So what happens next on that is, is really important. Why to why we're engaging with, with partners across BC, with uh, First Nations communities and leadership, with uh, other environmental groups, industry, foresters and others, as we get close to what uh, government is calling herd planning. So each individual herd of caribou in BC is going to have its own plan uh, put together by British Columbia as to how we can get them back up to recovery. Unfortunately, the commitment to include habitat protections, which we know caribou need, to include real robust recovery actions hasn't been put into those agreements yet. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, for, for all stakeholders, for all governments to get together and really figure out how we can look at the, the partnership agreement in the peace as a model for how caribou recovery can work and hopefully apply that to other regions in BC. Hey, thank you. Um, that's a great answer. And I guess I just have one more question. Sure. Um, and maybe the people who are watching this will be interested. So now that all of this is, is at this stage, what can people do to help uh, to continue standing up for caribou as we've been communicating it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can do. I, I, I really want to say thank you to everyone who has stood up for caribou um, in uh, in the past few years or in, in, in their lives. It's been an incredible campaign. And what I was told by both negotiators for the nations, for uh, governments, um, politicians, is that your voice was heard. Uh, when we helped get more than 4,000 um, submissions to government from individuals across British Columbia and Alberta as to whether, uh, as to how to recover caribou, that, that positivity, that interest in recovering caribou really mattered. It mattered to getting that agreement across the finish line. It mattered to um, showing politicians in Victoria and Ottawa that caribou matter to their constituents, that their constituents care about caribou. So I think it's really important that we keep that up. Um, you know, something as simple as writing a letter or sending off a, a, a a petition or a tweet or a Facebook post, it, it slowly builds up over time. If you're in a local community and you have caribou in your in your region, um, I would I would highly recommend you attend any government info, info sessions um, that will be held online in the coming days as we get into herd planning. Everybody has a right to have their voice heard on caribou. And I hope that uh, people across BC and Alberta and the whole Y2Y region and beyond continue to stand up for caribou, to continue to speak up for these animals and their habitat. Absolutely. It all makes a difference. Everything adds up. Um, thank you for saying that. And thank you again for talking with me today. Really appreciate your time. And it's nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Great. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Tim.